the abdomen. As we begin looking at the abdomen, uh, we must first begin by defining what is the peritoneum. Uh, the peritoneum is a thin, serous membrane that lines the abdominal cavity, and it's divided in th into the parietal and visceral peritoneum. Now, this is why the abdominal cavity is called the peritoneal cavity. Organs that are in the peritoneum are the liver, gallbladder, spleen, stomach, ovaries, and the majority of the intestines. So as you can see, the peritoneal cavity or the peritoneum actually houses quite a few organs. And so in this image, uh, we actually have a demonstration of the peritoneum cavity. And um, it's important for us to notice that there's a line here that pretty much uh, divides the peritoneum from the posterior uh, portion called the retroperitoneum. And so as we can see, we have uh, the liver, stomach, spleen, and uh, outside of it is the pancreas, kidneys, aorta, inferior vena cava, which is here. So pretty much we do see that there's a division between the peritoneum and the retroperitoneum. Uh, so it's important for us to know this. And uh, what I expect you to know from this image is all the structures that are labeled here, as well as uh, where we can see the peritoneum and not. And so just keep in mind that it's this horseshoe shaped area here. Uh, that's retroperitoneum. And this is peritoneum. So just keep that in mind. Uh, here we have another uh, demonstration. Um, I just want to put this on here just to kind of give you a, a representation of not really the peritoneum, but the way the organs actually look as we look at it from a sagittal view. Uh, we have the diaphragm, the liver, uh, this entire structure here. We have the stomach, and uh, we have the aorta here with uh, probably the celiac artery there. Uh, we don't see the SMA, uh, but we also do have uh, the small intestine, the peritoneal cavity, and as we can see, here's the, the peritoneal cavity. Uh, this is the real important, uh, the peritoneum is pretty much lining this area here. And we have a differentiation between uh, the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum. Uh, the parietal, as we see, <clears throat> is lining uh, the outside of the cavity. And uh, we don't really see the visceral peritoneum labeled here, uh, but the visceral peritoneum is what is actually covering the organs. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind here. Uh, you also hear this word tossed around uh, quite a bit, mesentery. Uh, the mesentery is a double layer of peritoneum which encloses the intestines and attaches it to the abdominal wall. So that's what kind of anchors the intestines. Uh, you always hear it referred to as the mesentery. And uh, you'll hear things such as mesenteric nodes things of that nature, and it's just important for us to understand what mesentery is. So basically, it's just a continuation of the peritoneum that anchors the intestines to the abdominal wall and keeps them from moving all over the place, uh, which would be very detrimental to uh, the intestinal health. You'll also hear this word, uh, omentum. Uh, it's a mesentery or double layer of peritoneum that is attached to the stomach. And so uh, the omentum is in relation to the stomach where the mesentery is the rest of the intestines. So moving forward, we have uh, a certain part of the liver known as the falciform ligament or falciform ligament, however uh, you would rather pronounce it. Uh, and we see that it extends from the liver to the anterior abdominal wall and diaphragm. 
and it is what really divides the liver anatomically into left and right lobes. And so uh, we'll see this as we look at an image here. So as we see, we have the entire liver structure pretty much here. And so uh, we have this area here, uh, and that is the falciform ligament. And from it, we gain the left and right lobes of the liver. And so it separates it anatomically. Also in this image, uh, I would like you to know um, the left lobe of the liver, the ligamentum venosum, uh, which is demonstrated here. Uh, also, the caudate lobe of the liver, which is uh, divided by the ligamentum venosum from the left lobe right here. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, here we have another uh, demonstration of the falciform ligament. And as we can see, we have the liver here, and we have the falciform ligament coming here, separating right from left lobes. Uh, we also have uh, in this drawing the stomach, the spleen, the pancreas, and also uh, we have uh, different spaces. Uh, we have the right subphrenic space, the left subphrenic space, uh, and this is going to become kind of uh, essential for us to understand because, uh, as we'll see, a lot of times ascites will actually accumulate in these spaces here uh, surrounding the liver. Uh, so just know that this area here is the right subphrenic. This is the left subphrenic space. So just keep those in mind. Uh, here we actually see... Uh, kind of what we were talking about. Uh, we have the liver and we have uh, the right subphrenic space here. We're not going to worry about the left subphrenic space on this because I feel that it's slightly more confusing. Um, if we did more uh, superior, a uh, more superior cut, then maybe potentially we could actually demonstrate the left subphrenic better. Uh, but we do see the kidneys here. We have the right kidney left kidney. Um, but the one thing that I want you to keep in mind here is that in the right subphrenic space, uh, we do have a lot of what looks to be fluid here. Uh, if you'll notice, we have this whole, and that is probably ascites that has actually accumulated here. And so let's discuss the peritoneum, peritoneum um, once again, oh, as we saw, we have the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum. Uh, much like the way the, the, the parietal and visceral pleura are over the lungs, uh, the parietal peritoneum lines the abdominal walls, whereas the visceral peritoneum covers the organs. The peritoneal cavity is a cavity that is created by the peritoneum, which houses the abdominal organs. Important thing to remember is that it's a closed cavity in males, whereas in females, it's a cavity that communicates with the exterior through the uterine tubes, uterus, and vagina in females. So where males have a closed peritoneal cavity, uh, females have an open peritoneal cavity. And we also have peritoneal spaces. We have the Morrison's pouch, which is part of the right subhepatic space, which is located between the liver and the kidney. And so, uh, as we can see, uh, I'll draw a crude drawing here. Uh, here's the liver. Here's the kidney. The Morrison's pouch will be located right there. And we know that it is the deepest point of the abdominal cavity in a supine position. However, um, it must be said that it is only in the supine position. Morrison's pouch does not define the deepest point in an erect position. It's only in a supine position. And that's a little dark there. Let me erase that and highlight it again. In a supine position. Uh, also, the reason why we focus on the Morrison's pouch is for one simple reason. It is the most common site for a collection of fluid in the abdominal cavity because it's deepest 
it will collect the fluid the most when you are laying flat on your back. Uh, in other words, uh, it's really specific to notice for uh, an accumulation of fluid and will help you in distinguishing uh, some abnormalities in the abdomen. We've also discussed retroperitoneum and um, structures located posterior to the peritoneum yet lined by it anteriorly. So uh, just because structures are located outside the peritoneum does not mean that they are not lined by the peritoneum because as we see here, they're lined by it anteriorly. So their anterior portion is affected by the peritoneum. However, the posterior portion is not, not lined by it. So structures labeled as retroperitoneum are these. We have the kidneys, the ureters, adrenal glands, pancreas, duodenum, aorta, inferior vena cava, bladder, uterus, and even the prostate gland. Uh, so if you'll notice, uh, these are structures that are typically located in the posterior portion of the body and not anterior. So that's a good way to think of it. The peritoneum is most of the time uh, the anterior portion of the body and the retroperitoneum is more so the posterior portion and that will help us keep things a little more straight. So we were talking about um, spaces and we do have uh, once again the right subphrenic space, uh, the left subphrenic space. Uh, so we have here and here. Uh, also we do have the right subhepatic space, which is below the liver, right here. And then we have the left subhepatic space, which is below uh, the greater curvature of the stomach. And then we have uh, the right pericolic gutter and the left pericolic gutter, but we're really not going to concern ourselves with these uh, for the moment. Uh, but in this crew drawing, we do have the liver, the stomach, uh, large intestine, which we're saying that this squiggly line is the small intestine. And we've got ascending, descending, and then we have uh, the sigmoid colon, the rectum, all of this. Oh, and I forgot transverse colon. Uh, but for the most part, just recognize... Um, the subphrenic and subhepatic spaces, both left and right. And that'll be what we need to do to keep everything kind of straight here. So the liver. We find that the liver is a large complex organ with numerous functions that include metabolic regulation, hematologic regulation, and bile production. It occupies a major portion of the right hypochondriac and epigastric regions. Uh, it's bordered superiorly, laterally, and anteriorly by the right hemodiaphragm, and it's bordered medially by the stomach. Gleason's capsule. It's a strong connective tissue that surrounds the liver, gives it its shape and stability to the soft hepatic tissue. Uh, so basically, as we see, uh, without the Gleason's capsule, there would be really no structure to the liver, and it would kind of just spill out all over the place. And the Gleason's capsule is what actually forms the structure of the liver and holds it in place. So it's very important. On the liver, we see that we have a gallbladder phosphate, uh, as we all well know, and it is the surface opposed to the inferior vena cava. And so it is... Uh, directly opposed to the inferior vena cava and it is where the gallbladder actually sits in and provides an area for the gallbladder to actually uh, sit in and allow it to function properly from this area. As, as we saw, uh, the liver is a very complex organ and it has several different fissures which actually divide the liver and make it in segments. Uh, the umbilical fissure which is the fissure for the ligamentum teres, uh, divides the left hepatic lobe into medial and lateral segments. The fissure for the ligamentum venosum separates the caudate lobe from the left lobe. The transverse fissure, or the portal fissure, uh, contains the horizontal portions of the right and left portal veins. The interlobar fissure, or main lobar fissure, 
divides the right from the left lobes of the liver, an imaginary line drawn through the gallbladder fossa and the middle hepatic vein to the inferior vena cava. And so uh, these are the fissures, or fissures of the liver, which brings us to the falciform ligament. Uh, the falciform ligament provides the structural support that attaches the upper surfaces of the liver to the diaphragm and the upper abdominal wall. So looking at the basic anatomy of the liver, uh, we see that we have a left lobe, a right lobe, a caudate lobe, and a quadrate lobe. So keep in mind, there are four lobes of the liver. Uh, the left lobe is the most anterior of the liver lobes, and it extends across the midline. Uh, then we have the right lobe, which is a very large lobe. Uh, the caudate lobe is the smallest lobe of the liver, located on the inferior and posterior liver surface, and sandwiched between the inferior vena cava and ligamentum venosum. Lastly is the quadrate lobe, which is located on the anterior inferior surface of the left lobe between the gallbladder and the ligamentum teres. And so this will all make more sense as we actually look at the images and uh, move away from just words on a page. Another thing that we have to keep in mind about the liver is the portal hepatic system. Uh, the portal hepatic system is how the liver receives nutrient-rich blood from the gastrointestinal tract. And the portal vein is the major vessel of the portal hepatic system. It's formed by the union of the superior mesenteric and splenic veins. It divides into right and left main portal veins. And is located posterior to the neck of the pancreas. It passes obliquely to the right posterior to the hepatic artery within the lesser omentum and enters the liver at the porta hepatis. Also in terms of the liver, we have the common hepatic artery, the right hepatic artery, the left hepatic artery, the right hepatic vein, middle hepatic vein, and the left hepatic vein. So several uh, areas of vasculature. Uh, the common hepatic artery supplies the liver with arterial blood. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind. It's one of three branches of the celiac artery. And so keep that in mind as well that it's part of the celiac artery. Uh, so the right hepatic artery is larger than the left, and it supplies the majority of the blood for the right lobe of the liver. So uh, the right hepatic uh, artery is supplying the right lobe of the liver. The left hepatic artery supplies the caudate, quadrate, and medial lateral segments of the left liver lobe. Uh, so the left hepatic artery supplies uh, pretty much the rest of the liver. And it's located between the lesser curvature of the stomach. Uh, so the thing to keep in mind is just what I have highlighted here, uh, that the common hepatic supplies the liver with arterial blood, and it's a branch of the celiac artery. Uh, the right hepatic artery supplies the right lobe of the liver, and the left hepatic artery pretty much supplies everything else. So uh, hopefully this will help you keep things a little more manageable and a little more uh, straightened out as we look at further uh, parts of the anatomy of the abdomen. So if we look at this image, uh, we see that we have uh, the diaphragm being number one, and it's this structure here. So if we uh, get rid of this, uh, then we see the liver in its entirety. We see that we have the falciform ligament running here. Uh, separating the right from the left lobes. Uh, we do see that we have the gallbladder fossa here. And um, that's pretty much all we need to know from this. Okay, in this image, uh, we see uh, that we have pretty much the entire abdomen labeled. Uh, we have the diaphragm which is completing the superior border for the liver. 
we have the right lobe of the liver here, the left lobe of the liver, and the falciform ligament here. Uh, just on the posterior portion of the liver, we have the gallbladder. And then we actually have uh, some of the, uh, the stomach labeled as well. Uh, so we have the esophagus coming in here. And then we have the stomach, the duodenum, and then we get to jejunum, ileum, cecum, ascending colon, transverse colon, descending colon, rectus sigmoid, rectum and so that is pretty much the entire uh, structure of the intestines uh, with the exception of just a few few minor things that, that we'll get to in just a second uh, but mostly at, at the moment we're really focusing on the liver and so while this is really not a detailed uh, diagram of the liver I would like you to know everything that's on this Uh, so in this image, uh, we see that we are probably midways through the liver, and we see that we have uh, several fissures here. We have uh, the fissure for the ligamentum teres, the interlobar fissure, which is the fissure for the gallbladder, the fissure for the ligamentum venosum, and the transverse fissure here. And so uh, we'll look at actual images in just a second, and hopefully that will make more sense to you. Okay, on this image, let's first begin by labeling the structures that we're seeing. We have the aorta, the stomach, spleen, and we have the liver. And so on the liver, we have the right lobe, left lobe. We have the falciform ligament here, which is very prominent. And then just anterior to the inferior vena cava, which is here, we have the ligamentum venosum. And also, uh, the ligamentum venosum separates the left lobe from the caudate lobe. So here is the caudate lobe, and then uh, as we continue on, we'll see uh, how the other lobes actually come in. Okay, on this image, we're actually looking at the venous system. So, we have the inferior vena cava coming down here. Then as we branch off the inferior vena cava, we have the right hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, and the left hepatic vein. As we look at the portal venous system, uh, we have uh, pretty much the portal vein right here branching into the right and the left main portal vein. And then as we come down, we have the superior mesenteric vein, which uh, the way that it comes out, we really don't see it uh, demonstrated really well here. And that is pretty much all we really need to know for the portal venous system. Also, we have the ileum, Cecum, ascending colon, descending colon, rectus sigmoid, rectum, spleen, diaphragm, right here, and that will be pretty much it for this diagram. Also from this diagram, uh, we want to know the common the proper, 
the left and the right hepatic artery. And so as we come in, we have the, com uh, the common hepatic artery merging into the proper hepatic artery. Then we have the left and the right hepatic artery. Also here we have the portal vein on the posterior portion uh, going into the left and the right portal vein. Looking at uh, the liver we also see that we have the common hepatic duct going into the common bile duct after uh, the gallbladder has attached to it and the gallbladder uses the cystic duct. So also know the cystic duct. Uh, looking at the gallbladder we have the fundus and the body well demonstrated here and also uh, this structure here is the stomach and so keep all of these structures in mind. Here we have the right lobe, the left lobe, falciform ligament, caudate lobe, descending aorta, inferior vena cava, adrenal, spleen, stomach, Okay, on this image of the abdomen, uh, we're looking at the liver. We see the liver uh, being this huge organ here. Uh, we have the left lobe, the right lobe. Uh, we have the falciform ligament residing right here. Uh, we have the inferior vena cava. And then we have the descending aorta. We have the spleen. And we have probably the fundus of the stomach. Additionally, we have this structure, which looks like the left adrenal gland. And the reason we can assume that it's the left adrenal gland is because the right adrenal gland and the right kidney come in just inferior to the left side uh, simply because the liver is so large that it uh, basically causes everything to be pushed down on the right side just a little bit. So that is the left adrenal, even though it's not really labeled here. Uh, here we have another image. Uh, we have the stomach. In its entirety, we have some portion of the small bowel. Uh, we have the spleen. We have the right lobe of the liver quadrate lobe here and then the caudate lobe here. Uh, we have the inferior vena cava and the descending aorta still in view. Uh, here we have uh, much the same. We have the fundus of the stomach. We have the spleen, we have the splenic vein, we have left adrenal, descending aorta, inferior vena cava, 
right lobe of the liver, probably still left lobe of the liver, So the gallbladder and the biliary system. Uh, the biliary system is composed of the gallbladder and the bile ducts. It drains the bile from the liver and stores it. And we should also note that it concentrates the bile more into a more potent form than what is originally coming out of the liver. Uh, the gallbladder is located in the gallbladder phosphor, which we have seen on CT and we've seen actually uh, through our images. Uh, the gallbladder fossa is located on the anterior inferior portion of the right lobe of the liver. And so, um, if we look at this word anterior inferior, meaning anterior and inferior. And so, basically, uh, what this means is that it's located on the anterior portion of the patient on the inferior side of the liver or underneath the liver. And so hopefully that will make it a little more, uh, make, make a little more sense to you, but it's also located on the right lobe of the liver. Okay, uh, parts of the gallbladder. We have the fundus, the body, and the neck. And so if I draw a crude diagram of the gallbladder, with this being the cystic duct. We have this being the fundus, this being the body, and this being the neck. So, um, as, as this says, uh, the fundus is the rounded distal portion of the gallbladder sac, which is this. Uh, the body is the widest portion, so as we can see, it's much wider. And the neck is the narrow portion that merges into the cystic duct. Okay, uh, Parts of the gallbladder. We have the fundus, the body, and the neck. And so if I draw a crude diagram of the gallbladder, with this being the cystic duct, we have this being the fundus, this being the body, and this being the neck. So, um, as, as this says, uh, the fundus is the rounded distal portion of the gallbladder sac, which is this. Uh, the body is the widest portion, so as we can see, it's much wider. And the neck is the narrow portion that merges into the cystic duct. So uh, we have the common hepatic duct, which as we saw comes from the liver. And it's located anterior to the portal vein and the lateral to the hepatic artery. We also have the common bile duct, which is the formation of both the cystic and common hepatic ducts. It's when they join together. So uh, taking a look at an image, we have the cystic duct coming from the gallbladder the common hepatic duct coming from the liver and at the point of where they join that is when this uh, common bile duct is actually formed and so we'll abbreviate common bile duct as the CBD we also have the main pancreatic duct which is also known as the duct of Wurzung and it will be abbreviated as the MPD uh, the antilla of water is the location where the common bile duct and the MPD pass through the sphincter of Odi is the circular muscles that surround both the CBD and the MPD at the ampulla of water, and so it helps to regulate what is passing through. Here's a diagram that's a little more uh, prevalent here. We have uh, the fundus of the gallbladder, the body, and we have the neck. And so at the neck, uh, we have the cystic duct. And then we have the right and left hepatic duct forming 
the common hepatic duct and meeting the cystic duct here. Once it meets the cystic duct, we have the common bile duct. And as we we're working our way down uh, to empty into uh, the intestines, we have a joining with the pancreatic duct or the main pancreatic duct. And so located here, we have the sphincter of Oda and the ampulla of water, which allows it to be passed into the duodenum and for all of the, the contents that these glands are producing to be dumped in. Here's another uh, kind of crude drawing. Once again, we'll go over this. We have the fundus. We have the fundus, the body, the neck, cystic duct, right and left hepatic duct, forming the common hepatic duct, then the, uh, the common bile duct going down, and then we have the duodenum coming down here to allow the emptying. Also, we see the liver here, and then we have the diaphragm, making the superior portion of the liver. Also, we have uh, the pancreas here, although we're not seeing the main pancreatic duct coming in. So just keep these structures in mind. Okay, uh, here we have the right portal vein and the left portal vein. Uh, based on the way that we're scanning through this in the axial plane, we're not really seeing a clear definition of the left portal vein. Also, we see the common hepatic duct here. Uh, notice the density or lack of density for the common hepatic duct. Uh, we see that in the veins, we've got uh, contrast filling or contrast bolus. Uh, however, we don't see really anything in the common hepatic duct. And it kind of has the density of a little bit of water and so uh, keep that in mind I don't expect you to know the hepatic artery branches uh, so let's mark that out because I feel that that is uh, a little too complex for this image because the image is not the greatest in the world but everything else uh, I would like you to know uh, just based on the structures know that the common hepatic duct is just slightly anterior to the right and left uh, portal vein So the pancreas. Uh, the pancreas is a long, narrow organ that can be divided into several portions, such as the head, the usinate process, the neck, body, and the tail. The uncinate process is the medial and posterior extension of the head of the pancreas. So on this image, we actually have the pancreas. We have the liver, the right lobe, and possibly the left lobe, maybe the falciform ligament here, right kidney, left kidney, descending aorta, inferior vena cava, and uh, we have a branch going like this off of the descending aorta, and based on the location, uh, with being in about midway through both kidneys, we would assume that this is this pure mesenteric artery. Uh, we have the spleen and we have the stomach with adjacent small bowel surrounding. Uh, we would probably assume that this is the duodenum just based on the location in its relationship to the stomach. The spleen is the largest lymph organ in the body, uh, posterior to the stomach in the left upper quadrant. And so we do have the gastrosplenic ligament, which is, attaches the spleen to the greater curvature of the stomach. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind, that the gastrosplenic 
as the name implies, gastro meaning stomach, spleen, splenic meaning spleen. Uh, it joins both the stomach and the spleen together so that uh, both of them serve as an anchoring point for each other. Now the adrenal glands. The adrenal glands, I'm sure as everyone knows, is paired and separated from the kidneys by the perirenal fat. There's two parts of the adrenal glands, uh, one being the cortex, the other being the medulla. The cortex is the outer portion of the adrenal, and it produces more than two dozen steroids or corticosteroids. The medulla, on the other hand, is the inner portion of the adrenal. It produces epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, which we uh, all know as adrenaline. Uh, the cortex, uh, as, the, as the name implies, is the outside, the medulla, uh, is the middle. The easy way to keep that straight is medium begins with MED and medulla begins with MED. And so uh, it's the middle portion or the inner portion. And so that'll be uh, an easier way to keep things straight uh, which one is which because I know sometimes it gets uh, students confused on which is the inner and the outer. So the medulla for the adrenal glands is going to be the middle portion or the inner. It's important to know uh, the difference between the right and left adrenal gland. Uh, the right adrenal gland is located posterior to the inferior vena cava and it's lower and more medial than the left. The left adrenal gland on the other hand lies anterior medial to the upper pole of the left kidney. And so basically we have to keep in mind that there are different positions here um, and so uh, the right's going to be just slightly lower and when we get to thinking about it the left kidney always is well usually is sitting just slightly higher than the right and so uh, that makes sense if we think that the adrenal glands are situated on top of the kidneys with separation by the perirenal fat that brings us to Gerardo's fascia. Uh, it encloses the kidneys and the adrenals and functions to anchor the kidneys and adrenals to surrounding structures. So basically, it helps protect the kidneys from bumps or jolts. And so uh, it's very important that we have Gerardo's fascia because if we don't, then uh, even simply riding in a car will prove to be unsustainable for the kidneys because they would be pretty much moving around all over the place and you would wind up injuring or ripping ureters, things like that. And it uh, wouldn't be a pleasant experience for the human body at all. So it's very necessary for the, the adrenals and the kidneys to have this. So uh, looking at this drawing here, uh, we have the adrenal gland here sitting on top of the kidney. And so uh, we have the aorta here, the inferior vena cava here, and so we have the renal artery coming in and the renal vein leaving. Uh, we also have the ureter coming down here, the renal pelvis existing here. But the real reason for this diagram is we want to focus on this image over here, uh, which is the adrenal gland. And so as we can see, if you did a cross section of it, it almost looks like a Y or an upside down Y. And we have uh, the outer portion, which is uh, pretty much all of this which is the cortex. The inner portion here is the medulla and as we said before uh, the cortex is in charge of producing steroids whereas the medulla is in charge of producing epinephrine and norepinephrine. Uh, so that's something to keep in mind and uh, hopefully uh, to try and keep straight. Here is what the adrenal glands can actually look like. Uh, many times you're going to see them 
on CT look uh, pretty much like these. Uh, it's been said many times, I've had uh, different radiologists tell me uh, that uh, the easy way to look at, at the renal glands is you look for an upside down Y. And so something like that uh, will be what you see for the adrenal glands. Also, um, sometimes it's very difficult to discern abnormalities on the adrenal glands. If uh, one side is thickened, uh, sometimes you'll see a large area of thickening here on the adrenal gland. And, and so sometimes it becomes necessary to look at it in multiple planes just to see if there is an abnormality or it's just the plane that you're going through that makes it look like this. But always be looking in your abdomens uh, for an upside down Y because that will denote to you what is actually uh, the adrenal gland. So that brings us to the urinary system. As we know, the urinary system's function is to filter blood, produce and excrete urine, and to help maintain normal body physiology. So the renal system has a, a very important function, um, very important, and without uh, good renal sufficiency, then we see that patients uh, typically are not in the best health. Um, we see patients who have decreased uh, renal sufficiency actually having to go on dialysis, and when they go on dialysis, uh, many times it is a, is very poor prognosis for the patient. So it's necessary to have a healthy urinary system. So if we begin with the urinary system, we see that we have the kidneys. Uh, the retroperitoneal, uh, as we found out before, uh, they're being shaped and they're located in the paravertebral gutters. They're oblique in orientation, meaning that the kidneys do not lie. If we're laying flat on our back, the kidneys are just not like this and this. Uh, the kidneys are actually more of an oblique top fashion. The upper poles are more medial and posterior. They're located between T12 and L4. Uh, there is no given position that they're going to begin at T12. Uh, sometimes they begin at L1, uh, but usually they're ending by L4. Each kidney has 7 to 14 minor calluses. These merge into two or three major calluses. Uh, the major calluses form the renal pelvis, which is the UPJ, or the uh, ureter pelvic junction and so um, if we if we'll see in the diagram what the major and minor calluses actually look like uh, the right kidney is slightly lower than the left due to the liver uh, so that is the reason why we have the right adrenal sitting slightly lower than the left and the right kidney sitting slightly lower than the left it's because of the prominence of the liver uh, renal cortex uh, comprises the outer one-thirds of the renal tissue, has extensions between the renal pyramids of the medulla, and it contains the nephron, glomerulus, and the convoluted tubules. And so once again, uh, the cortex is on the out, and the medulla is on the in. Uh, the renal medulla consists of segments called the renal pyramids, and it contains the loop of Henle. And so as we exit out of the kidneys, we, we come to the ureters, which are paired muscular tubes that transport urine to the urinary bladder. They will originate at the renal pelvis, and they're anterior and medial to the zoas muscles. And so as we look at it, uh, keep that in mind that your ureters are always going to run slightly anterior to the zoas muscles. Uh, many times as we're going through the abdomen and pelvis and we uh, hit the ureters, uh, for a few moments it's very easy to track where the ureters are going. As, but as we get into uh, more of the pelvic area, it becomes more difficult to actually discern what is maybe a vessel and what is a ureter. And sometimes it's uh, very easy to lose where the ureter is. 
So it becomes necessary that we remember that they're anterior and slightly medial to the psoas muscles. So if we look at uh, just a kind of crude drawing, here's the vertebral body. Here's the zoas muscles, and there is usually where the ureters actually lie. So slightly uh, anterior and medial to them. So looking at this diagram, uh, we see that we have the adrenal glands here. And then we have uh, the kidney. And so uh, if we'll notice, we have this structure kind of running here. And that is uh, gerata's fascia. And we also have uh, surrounding kidneys and the adrenals. All of this stuff here. And that is the perirenal fat. Also, if, as we're looking at this, we have minor calluses here. And if we'll notice, they all come together to form one large area. And so it's these points of fusion here and here and here uh, that we're going to say that those are the major calluses. And so after we pass through the major calluses, the major calluses come together here and form the renal pelvis. And as we depart from the renal pelvis, we go down to the ureter, which is then the UPJ right here. And so uh, if we'll notice uh, as we're doing CTs, on patients who have a history of renal stones and they're experiencing uh, flank pain, things like that, blood in the urine, uh, a lot of the times you'll see a stone actually caught here in the, in the UPJ. Uh, it seems like there's just something about this turn uh, to go down the ureter that uh, sometimes is a little difficult for renal stones to actually do. Once again, everything kind of looks a little different on CT though. Uh, it's not quite as cut and dry. So if we begin with this being T12, then we've got a one two, three, four, five. So remember that we said T12 to around L4. So on in this case, we have uh, the right kidney extending down from one to four and the left from 12 to three. And so uh, the left kidney, once again, is situated just slightly higher than the right. So let's get rid of all of this on it. And let's look at the kidney. Uh, we have the medulla, which is the renal pyramids, here, 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 and here. So that is all the medulla. We don't really see the adrenal gland, uh, but one thing I want you to take notice here is the zoas muscle, which is here. Uh, on the coronal images, it really doesn't display very well, but we do have uh, the zoas muscles uh, on the axial images to use as a reference, and they are an excellent reference point. Also, we have, uh, in, a, in addition to the medulla, we have uh, the cortex that kind of comes here and pretty much surrounds the medulla, something like this. Let me erase that. And 
And for this image, I believe that that is all that we can really gather from it. Uh, here is a little better uh, image so that we can kind of differentiate where everything is. So we have the, the medulla here and here and here. Okay, so this is all the medulla and all of the yellow is the cortex so hopefully that allow you to keep things a little a little more straight uh, as you're looking at images uh, uh, keep in mind that the medulla has the renal pyramids in them and so hopefully that will allow you to delineate between the cortex and the medulla also we have one two three four five six seven minor calluses and as we notice uh, they all join into three major calluses and so it's at this point here and here and here that we have the major calluses and if we'll notice they all are running inward to form the renal pelvis and as we get to the renal pelvis we also see that we have the ureter so we're the joining of the ureter and the renal pelvis we have the UPJ here uh, so hopefully that'll that allows you to make a little more sense And um, pretty much uh, in this image, looking at this axial image, uh, we see that we've passed the kidneys now, and we're actually working our way uh, through down towards the pelvis and so we have uh, probably the ileum, uh, ileocecal valve going into the cecum here uh, we have uh, jejunum here and working on ileum there uh, but really what we're wanting to focus on is the relationship of the ureters to the zoas muscles and so uh, we have once again the zoas muscles kind of outlined there. So if I remove this outline so that we can better see, uh, we have these two white dots. Uh, and if you look at the relationship with the zoas muscles, uh, the left one tends to follow uh, what we said a little more closely than what this uh, right one does based on this image. But uh, either way, notice how they are more medial and their anteromedial to uh, the zoas muscles. Uh, so pretty much you look uh, just uh, at the zoas muscles, go straight up and then go across and you'll hit the ureter. And usually it tracks this way all the way down as, as we're working our way towards the pelvis. And so uh, at this moment, it really helps us keep what we're seeing straight and and recognizing that it's not something else it's not an, a vessel that we uh, are not that that we're looking at but it's rather the ureter <clears throat> okay as we're looking at this image it kind of shows what I'm sure we've all kind of took notice of as we're looking at CT uh, that around the kidney there's a lot of empty space and so uh, we have anterior perirenal space posterior perirenal space 
And then we also have the pararenal or to the side of the renal space. Um, both of these. Also we have uh, the inferior vena cava. And the aorta here. Uh, this image is kind of dark, uh, and I wish we had the capabilities to actually lighten it up as we're looking at it here so that we can see other structures. Uh, however, uh, let's just take a, an inventory of what we're seeing. We have the liver here, the spleen there. Uh, we have probably L5, 4, 3, 2, uh, 1, 12 here. Uh, left is sitting up slightly a little higher than the right with this being the left side and this being the right side. So uh, looking at the kidneys we have the left kidney, the right kidney here and then uh, we have this, this structure here, uh, which is the left adrenal gland. We can kind of see the right adrenal gland here, but not not very well. The left is better demonstrated here, uh, and it still kind of holds that shape that we've talked about. I notice that it's separated by the, by the pararenal fat from the kidney. We have uh, left and right pararenal spaces. We have a uh, posterior pararenal space being this area here. And that's pretty much it that we have for uh, this image. Uh, also, we have the zoas muscles running here, uh, which in coronal we get a better indication of where. Uh, the ureters are in relationship to the zoas muscles because we can see the proximity as we're scrolling through the images. Uh, but for pretty much this image, just uh, know each and every one of these bullet points on it as it will help you paint an overall picture of the abdomen. So here's a 3D volume reconstruction and as we can see it does an excellent job of demonstrating the bladder and the ureters falling all the way down to the bladder. We also have the left kidney, the right kidney, the renal pelvis here and here leading into the ureters, so the UPJ. And we have the UVJ here, which we're not really demonstrating very well. Uh, but that's pretty much it for this image. Uh, as 3D reconstructions actually do an excellent job of demonstrating the ureters, but to get to this point and isolating these systems, we have to pretty much remove everything else. And so uh, we lose the pararenal fat, the pararenal spaces, things like that, uh, so that we can better demonstrate the ureters. Uh, going just slightly inferior, now we're seeing that we have the kidneys coming in. We have the right kidney. We'll label it as RK. We have the left kidney, which we'll label as LK. We have the inferior vena cava, the descending aorta. We have primarily small bowel in this area. Uh, possibly we're seeing some portion of uh, the transverse colon coming in to our field of view. We have uh, the right lobe of the liver. And 
And I do believe that's it for this image. Okay, here we have uh, the liver actually going out. And we have uh, the inferior vena cava sending a aorta. We have right kidney, left kidney, small bowel. Uh, we have Gerardus phagia, kind of enclosing the kidney um, on both sides. Additionally, we have Morrison's pouch bilaterally, uh, which as we have discussed previously, it is the deepest point in the abdominal cavity when a person is laying supine. Notice that it all changes when a person is erect but laying supine, this is the most deep portion of the abdominal cavity. Uh, we have uh, renal spaces, uh, posterior and anterior, but we're not really going to worry as much about those because on many images they're very, very difficult to see, depending on uh, a patient's body habitus. So on this image, uh, notice we're still going a little farther inferior. The liver's going out. We're actually seeing the gallbladder on this image. We have uh, the descending aorta, the inferior vena cava, and uh, we have this pure mesenteric vein here and this pure mesenteric artery. We have the right kidney, left kidney. And we're actually seeing the head of the pancreas in this area. Uh, the common bile duct's a little difficult to see it's around this area. But for the most part, we're just going to focus on um, the main organs. Just because they're, they're, everything like this is a little more difficult to see in terms of MRI versus CT, just based on a uh, patient motion. Here we have the head of the pancreas. We have the duodenum. This could be uh, possibly jejunum, right kidney, left kidney, descending aorta, inferior vena cava, gallbladder, liver, so the stomach. The stomach has four major functions. Number one is to store food. Number two is to break down food. Number three is the dissolution of chemical bonds so that food can be broken down uh, as the abdomen, as food actually goes through the rest of the intestines throughout the abdomen. And then number four is the production of the intrinsic factor, which also enables food to be broken down. It's located under the left dome of the diaphragm, as we all know, and it's one of the most vascular organs of the body. And so uh, that's what makes the stomach... Uh, pretty dangerous because if there's any damage uh, because of the, its vascularity that uh, a person can actually bleed uh, internally and die from these injuries simply because of uh, injury to the stomach which most people don't really think about. Uh, if we begin with the stomach we have the esophagastric junction and that's where the esophagus and the stomach unite and so that's uh, just as we saw the UPJ being where uh, the renal pelvis and the ureter join, we have this esophagogastric junction. Uh, this is supposed to have an S here. Uh, I just now noticed it. There should be an S, gastric, not gastric. Uh, junction is where the esophagus and the stomach actually come together. 
However, uh, it's very necessary that we have a sphincter here that regulates what is coming out. Remember, like the valves of the heart, we want things to be able to go in, but we don't really want things to go out. And so uh, this is what the cardiac sphincter does. It's the sphincter at the esophagogastric junction uh, to keep things from coming back out of the stomach. Uh, and many times we see that if patients have abnormalities with a cardiac sphincter, uh, then many times they have uh, things such as gastric reflux uh, because the sphincter is not able to really clamp down and regulate what's coming back out. And so fluids have a tendency to come back out and uh, you feel the pain throughout your esophagus based on that. We also know that the stomach has a greater and lesser curvature. Uh, the lesser curvature is the inner curvature of the stomach. So let me draw a diagram here. So this is the stomach. Uh, we have the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. And uh, when you think about it, this is not quite as much as this. Uh, we have a huge sweeping curve here and really a very small curve there. So this is the difference between the lesser and greater curvatures. Uh, the greater curvature is the outer curvature of the stomach. So uh, just remember inner is lesser, outer is greater. And so uh, if you were going around, if we refer back to this image, if we were going around uh, on a track and uh, we were running against each other, it would be smarter to take the inside track than the outside because it would be a greater distance going here than it would here. And so that's the way to keep them straight because the greater has to go farther than the lesser. We also see that the stomach has a body and it's the largest portion of the stomach. The fundus is above the body of the stomach and the pyloric antrum is the bottom part of the stomach, which empties into the duodenum. So if we were to draw another crude image here of a stomach, we see that this is the fundus. So we'll put an F here. This is the body. And this little area here is the pyloric antrum. Uh, so hopefully that will... Uh, make a little more sense to you as we look at uh, some images throughout CT. Also, we cannot forget that uh, there's a pyloric sphincter just as there is a cardiac sphincter. And it's what regulates what is emptied into the duodenum. And so it allows the passage of food into the duodenum uh, after the chemical bonds have actually been broken down utilizing uh, the enzymes contained into the stomach. Also, we have rugae uh, that are present in the stomach, and they're prominent folds that allow the stomach to expand with food. And so, uh, typically when the stomach is expanded with food, you don't really see rugae, but when the stomach is empty, that's when you see them because uh, they're prominent, and when the stomach gets stretched out, everything looks like one smooth organ. And when uh, they're not, when the stomach's not expanded, then everything kind of collapses. I kind of compare this to an accordion where when the, cord when the accordion is pulled apart, you really don't see all the little divisions in the bellows. But when you bring the accordion back together, then you start seeing the divisions here in the bellows uh, that are not present when you stretch it out. And so that's kind of the same way that the rugae actually function. It allows the stomach to expand to a greater capacity than what it normally would if it was a fixed width. Uh, so here we see uh, just a complete stomach and then a dissection on your immediate right. And so we have the fundus being in this area, uh, the body, and then the pyloric antrum here. Also take notice that uh, Food actually empties not into the fundus, but into the body. 
we have the cardiac notch here, which is created uh, by the esophagus for, uh, forming at the esophagogastric junction and the fundus residing above it. We have uh, the cardiac antrum and the cardiac sphincter located here. We also have the lesser curvature and the greater curvature. And we have the, have the pyloric sphincter here, which keeps uh, food from going down prematurely into the duodenum, uh, which is here. If we refer to the image on the right now, we're able to see the cardiac sphincter here and the pyloric sphincter. Uh, just anterior to the pyloric sphincter, we have the duodenal bulb, which is this area, which is a flared end as the duodenum actually connects to the pyloric antrum. Uh, in this cross section, we can also see the rugae, which are all these little kind of squiggly lines that are in this, which allow the stomach to expand as food is entered into it. Okay, so in this image we see just a small cross section of the stomach. Uh, we're looking at the body here. And we have the lesser curvature and the greater curvature of the stomach. And we do see that we have oral contrast inside the stomach, but we also have the presence of air residing in it too. Uh, that's something to, to keep notice of. As the patient's laying supine, the air is always going to go to the, towards the anterior portion or the most superior portion as someone's laying supine. We also see that we have the pyloric antrum here as it's getting ready to exit the stomach and go into the duodenum. Uh, this is why we have the pancreas here in a small cross section. Um, we don't really see too much of the pancreas, we just see that we have uh, the pancreas here. And uh, as this image is labeling it, the body of the pancreas, which, is, which seems to be correct because we're not seeing the head of the pancreas, nor are we seeing the duodenum at this moment. So this brings us to the small intestines, uh, where we will see more connection and how this actually uh, correlates with uh, the pancreas. So the small intestine or the small bowel, as uh, sometimes you'll hear these kind of used interchangeably, uh, it's located between the pylorus and the ileocecal valve. So the pyloric antrum and the ileocecal valve is all small bowel or small intestine. And it consists of loops of bowel averaging six to seven meters in length. Uh, so it's between um, 18 and 21 feet in length, uh, which seems highly unlikely based on the way that the you wouldn't think that you could have 21 feet of anything inside uh, of your abdomen. However, uh, the small bowel, based on the way that it's laid out, can actually do this. And it's subdivided into the duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. If we begin with the duodenum, we see that it's the smallest portion. It begins at the gastric pylorus and curves around the head of the pancreas, forming the letter C. So keep that in mind. You'll hear this tossed around a lot, the C loop of the duodenum. Uh, that's where the head of the pancreas resides. And the duodenum is divided into four portions. We have the first, or the most superior portion. It's formed by the first two inches of the duodenum, the conical shaped duodenal bulb. So the duodenal bulb is around two inches in length, and that's the first portion of the duodenum. Uh, also, we want to keep in mind that the duodenal bulb is the most common site for pill for peptic ulcer formation. The second or descending portion of uh, the duodenum is formed by the next four inches. So keep that in mind, four inches of the duodenum that descends along the right side of the, of the vertebral column. And it contains the ampulla of water and receives pancreatic and biliary drainage. So as we saw previously, uh, the ampulla of water, uh, which allows and, and the sphincter of Odi, which allows the MPD and the CBD to actually empty into it. That is the second portion of the duodenum. The third or horizontal portion of the duodenum is about 10 to 10 centimeters long and runs horizontally in front of the third lumbar vertebrae. 
of the fourth or ascending portion is about 2.5 centimeters in length and ascends on the left side of the aorta to the level of the L2 vertebrae. So if you average this out, We have about 18 and a half centimeters here, uh, which is not very long in respect to uh, there being around 21 feet of intestinal or small bowel in the body. Uh, so as we see, it's not the duodenum is in relationship to uh, the jejunum and the ileum uh, quite short. The jejunum, on the other hand, is approximately 2.5 meters in length. So uh, keep that in mind that it's around 2.5 meters. So around uh, about 7.5 feet. It occupies the left upper abdomen or umbilical region of the abdomen. And it's where the bulk of chemical digestion and nutrient absorption occurs. The real thing that kind of gives it away in terms of CT is this, that it has a feathery appearance. Uh, this may not make any sense right now, but as we look at CT, you'll notice that uh, as, we trans as we transition from the duodenum to the judenum, uh, there's an interesting uh, way that the judenum actually looks, and that's simply because of the appearance. And the appearance really kind of gives it away where you're actually entering in. The last portion of the small bowel is the ileum. And it's the longest portion of the small intestine, averaging around 3.5 meters long. And so, uh, basically, that's about 10.5 feet long. Um, The loops of the ileum terminate at the ileocecal valve. And so that's something that we're going to be looking at as well as the ileocecal valve. Uh, the ileocecal valve is a sphincter that controls the flow of material from the ileum into the cecum of the large intestine. And so the body helps to regulate itself by not allowing food to pass before maximum amount of nutrients are absorbed. The body is a very efficient power plant that it does not allow much waste. Uh, only when there's tons of unnecessary things does the body allow waste to go through. And so if we look at this, uh, I know that this image is not really a good demonstration of the small intestine, but it does really kind of show uh, bits and pieces of it. We have the jejunum in this area here. Then we have the ileum forming the ilocecal valve here, the cecum, the ascending colon, hepatic flexure, transverse colon, splenic flexure, descending colon, rectus sigmoid, and then the rectum. And so if we look at this small little cutaway here, we have the ileum coming in the ileocecal valve here, and then coming to the cecum. We also have to notice that the appendix is not part of the ileum, but it's part of the cecum. So that is something that we have to keep in mind as well. Uh, if we're looking at this image, uh, we see that we have the liver. We're not really seeing the stomach, but we do have the gallbladder here as well. Uh, we have the ileum here, here, and here, and uh, we have the jejunum here. And I want you to take notice of the contrast between this and this. Notice how uh, the jejunum has this feathery type appearance, it's just kind of mottled. And uh, as we enter into the ileum, everything is more clear and defined. And so that's how we're going to delineate between the jejunum and the ileum. Also, we have the ileocecal valve, which is really not demonstrated here uh, in its entirety. So uh, we're not going to worry about it on this image. Uh, but just know that this is the cecum here. Uh, 
Uh, this one kind of demonstrates to you uh, the difference between the, the ilium and the jejunum once again. Notice how the appearance of the jejunum is just so different than what we're looking at in terms of the ilium. The ilium is more clear to find, and the jejunum just has this feathery appearance. There's really no better terminology to really label it with than feathery. That's how we're going to know whether we're an ilium or the jejunum. If we'll remember, there's only around uh, 18 centimeters uh, that the duodenum actually occupies. So chances are we're not going to be looking at the duodenum very much after we get outside of the sea loop of the duodenum and just a few more centimeters. And so uh, the majority of what we're going to be looking at is the jejunum and the ilium, whereas the, ju uh, the jejunum is slightly shorter than what the ilium is. Uh, but we do see that uh, the jejunum is is quite impressive uh, if you if you look at it how it actually appears. Uh, once again, here we have the jejunum based on the look here. Uh, then we do have the ilium here and here, and we presume this to be ilium as well based on the look. Uh, but we do have the ileocecal valve. Here, which looks uh, almost like the patient has swallowed something and uh, we're seeing it kind of highlight in CT but that's not really what it is this is the ileocecal valve uh, I can't promise that you're gonna have every ileocecal valve actually look like this uh, but chances are if you're in the cecum and you can trace the ileum coming to it what you're seeing is going to be the ileocecal valve uh, we also want to note that this is the cecum here and uh, for this image I believe that pretty much does it. Once again we have the ilium and we have the cecum uh, so we have the cecum here, ilium coming in here uh, we don't really see the ileocecal valve but we do see another structure and this is the what the book calls the veriform appendix but you'll hear it in your uh, clinical sites in your work uh, is just the appendix. Uh, many times you don't see them easily defined uh, as such, but uh, here in this image it really kind of lays out very well. Uh, for those of you who are in the pathology class, uh, we've discussed that uh, sometimes looking at or looking for the appendix in the coronal plane tends to be uh, more beneficial than actually looking at it in the axial plane as it will kind of separate the structures a little better. Also, um, we have the zoas muscles here and here. Uh, and on this non iodinated contrast, uh, IV contrast skin, we really don't distinguish uh, the ureters here. But we do have the sigmoid colon. And if we'll notice, the sigmoid colon is much larger than we have a small bowel like this and this. And so uh, we assume that this is large bowel simply because of the size. The large intestine. It lies inferior to the stomach and liver and almost completely frames the small intestine. It has a larger diameter and thinner walls than the small intestine and is approximately 1.5 meters long. So uh, basically it's about four and a half feet in length, uh, much shorter than the smaller intestine. It starts at the ileocecal junction and ends at the anus. There are three main divisions of the large intestine which are the cecum, colon, and the rectum. The major function of the large intestine include the reabsorption of water and the storage and elimination of fecal material. So if we first begin with the large intestine, we have to begin with the cecum. Uh, the cecum is a pouch-like section of the proximal portion of the large intestine and it's located at the ileocecal valve. Uh, and it is where the veriform appendix is attached. The colon, uh, typically what we're thinking about, is the longest portion of the large intestine and it's divided into four distinct portions. The ascending, transverse, descending, and sigmoid. 
And then we get to the rectum, which is the terminal portion of the colon, and it's considered a pelvic organ. So uh, that's something to keep in mind, that the rectum is considered a pelvic organ. And so technically, if you're doing only a CT abdomen, uh, you should not be seeing the rectum because it is considered a pelvic organ. So uh, one of the many benefits of CT is that we can do all kinds of, of nice 3D reconstructions and kind of lay everything out. And so here we see that we have a 3D reconstruction and we have the cecum beginning here, the ascending colon, the hepatic flexure, and then we kind of lose the transverse colon, but we regain it, get to the splenic flexure, get the descending colon, come around here and we get the sigmoid, and then we come down to the rectum and the anus. And so uh, this is kind of just a generalized overview. Uh, we're not going to worry about the jejunum or the ilium on this image because I feel that that's kind of far beyond what we can actually view. And we really can't tell whether this is jejunum or ilium because it's all kind of a jumbled mess there. Um, and so uh, everything else, though, is fair game for this image. Uh, let me go back one image. Uh, here we have uh, the kidneys liver, and there's the left kidney. Uh, we have the jejunum located in this area based on the feathery appearance. We don't really see the ilium. So let me erase everything here. And we have uh, what probably is the descending colon here. Uh, we got the hepatic flexure there and we got the transverse colon going this way. And so uh, that's just something to keep in mind. Uh, the transverse colon, it's always going to be your most uh, anterior portion of the colon. And it's going to look on supine the most superior. Uh, and it's what helps create this frame. It's one of the sections of uh, the large intestine that very rarely people will not be able to to distinguish because it has just a certain look to it. On this image, uh, notice we're a little more uh, proximal. And so we have a greater amount of the liver. We have kidneys here and here. And we have this, this area and this area. And so uh, we're probably at the most superior portion here where we're getting ready to go into uh, the transverse colon which we presume to be just right here in just a couple slices. But we're seeing a flexure here. We're seeing the hepatic flexure on the right and the splenic flexure on the left. Uh, so that's something that, that should be fairly easy to actually keep in mind. And so pretty much everything on this image is fair game as well. So that brings us to the abdominal aorta and its branches. Uh, the ab abdominal aorta is a retroperitoneal structure and has a gradual diminishment of its diameter as it descends the abdomen just left of the midline next to the vertebral bodies. It delivers blood to all the abdominal pelvic organs and structures and at L4 the abdominal aorta bifurcates into the right and left common iliac arteries. We see that there is a paired parietal or dorsal branches, which supply the diaphragm and trunk wall and include the inferior phrenic and lumbar arteries. Uh, so we're not going to worry too much about everything. I just want you to know really what it does, and that it supplies the diaphragm and the trunk wall. The inferior phrenic arteries are the first to branch from the lateral surface of the abdominal aorta, just as it descends through the aortic hiatus. The phrenic arteries extend to supply the inferior surface of the diaphragm and dispatch the superior suprarenal arteries to the upper poles of the suprarenal glands. And so, uh, just know that they um, form the suprarenal arteries that supply the suprarenal glands. The lumbar arteries... As we know, there are four pairs, and they rise from the posterior wall of the abdominal aorta at the level of L1 through L4. Uh, and the reason it doesn't go to L5 is simply because it bifurcates at L4. Uh, 
Uh, it supplies the posterior abdominal wall, lumbar vertebrae, and the inferior end of the spinal cord. So know that there are four pairs and they supply the posterior abdominal wall, lumbar vertebrae, and the inferior end of the spinal cord. The suprarenal arteries, uh, they exit the lateral walls of the aorta near the base of the superior mesenteric artery. These arteries course laterally and slightly superiorly to supply the adrenal glands. So suprarenal arteries are going to supply the adrenal glands. The renal arteries arise from the lateral walls of the aorta just below the superior mesenteric artery. It continues horizontally to the hilum of the corresponding kidney. The right renal artery is slightly longer than the left renal artery, so keep that in mind that the right is slightly longer than the left. Typically, the left kidney is higher than the right kidney, which means the left renal artery is generally slightly superior to the right. So, as we saw before, the right is slightly inferior to the left kidney, and because of this, we know that the renal artery is going to track the same way as well. As each renal artery reaches the renal hilum, it typically divides into anterior and posterior branches from which five segmental arteries arise. The apical, upper, middle, lower, posterior. All of these are branches of the renal artery at the hilum. But uh, pretty much what I want you to know about this is what I have highlighted here. We also have the gonadal arteries. Uh, the gonadal arteries originate from the anterior wall of the aorta, just inferior to the renal arteries. They descend along the zoas muscles to reach their respective organs. In males, the gonadal arteries are termed the testicular arteries and supply the testes and scrotum. So know that the gonadal arteries in males supply the testes and the scrotum. In females, they are termed the ovarian arteries and supply the ovaries, uterine tubes, and uterus. Uh, so just keep that in mind these two structures. So the celiac trunk. It's a very short vessel that leaves the anterior wall of the aorta just after the aorta passes through the diaphragm. It divides into three branches, the left gastric, the common hepatic, and the splenic arteries. Variations of the celiac trunk are not rare. Celiac artery can branch from the superior mesenteric artery as well. So the left gastric artery courses superiorly and leftward within the lesser omentum, supplies the cardiac region of the stomach, the abdominal, esophagus, and the body of the stomach. So once again, just know what the left gastric artery does. The right gastric artery uh, branches off the hepatic artery. The common hepatic artery uh, crosses to the right toward the superior aspect of the duodenum and divides into the hepatic artery proper at the gastroduodenal artery. It divides into right and left branches. The right hepatic branch dispatches the cystic artery to the gallbladder and supplies the segments of the right and caudate lobes of the liver. So know that the right hepatic branch supplies uh, segments of the right and caudate lobes of the liver. The left branch also gives off an artery to the caudate lobe as well as medial and lateral segment arteries to supply the segments of the left lobe and the intermediate branch to the quadrate lobe. So the left branch is going to supply the left lobe and quadrate lobe. The splenic artery is the largest branch of the celiac trunk and, pass, and passes to the left behind the stomach and along the upper border of the pancreas. It gives off numerous pancreatic branches that supply the body and tail of the pancreas including the dorsal, great, and caudal pancreatic arteries. It gives rise to the left gastroepilotic or gastroomental artery, which gives off epilotic and gastric branches to the greater omentum and anterior and posterior walls of the fundus of the stomach. Uh, so pretty much what you need to know here is that uh, the splenic artery is going to supply the body and tail of the pancreas, including the dorsal, greater, and caudal pancreatic arteries, as well as the spleen due to its uh, bifurcations. Now we get to the superior mesenteric artery or the SMA. It branches just below the celiac trunk at approximately the level of L1. So know that the SMA comes in usually around L1. It descends behind the body of the pancreas and then over the horizontal portion of the duodenum to course into the mesentery to the ileum. 
The superior mesenteric artery supplies the head of the pancreas and the majority of the small and large intestines. And so I uh, just keep that in mind that the SMA supplies uh, the head of the pancreas and most of the large and small intestines. So that is very important. The inferior mesenteric artery, or the IMA, uh, arises three to four centimeters above the bifurcation of the aorta at approximately the level of L3 or L4. So usually around L3 you're going to see the IMA. It descends in front of the abdominal aorta and then to the left where it gives off the left colic artery, sigmoid arteries, and the superior rectal arteries. And so we see that these things... Um, like the left colic artery supplies the walls of the left third of the transverse colon and the entire descending colon. Uh, so the left colic artery is going to be uh, some of the transverse colon and entire descending colon. Sigmoid branches uh, course within the mesentery to supply the branches to the terminal descending colon into the sigmoid colon. Uh, so the sigmoid branches, sigmoid colon. The superior rectal artery crosses the common iliac artery in vein as it descends to branch and supply the rectum. So uh, pretty much with the IMA, you should be able to figure out what which one is which. Um, colic artery, transverse colon, and descending colon. Sigmoid supplies mostly the sigmoid. And the rectal artery supplies the rectum. Uh, also, uh, the splenic artery is the largest branch of the celiac truck and trunk and passes to the left behind the stomach and along the upper border of the pancreas. It gives off numerous pancreatic branches that supply the body and tail of the pancreas, including the dorsal, great, and caudal pancreatic arteries. Okay, on this image we have um, the inferior vena cava here. The portal vein here and the splenic vein coming off to the left uh, to actually supply or return blood from the spleen. We also have what looks to be the tail of the pancreas here, right and left kidneys, liver, and the spleen. Uh, we also have what looks to be the transverse colon here. Also we have the aorta And one of the things to look at is we have ribs still coming off here. So we're getting ready to pass probably into L1. Uh, this is probably uh, the celiac artery or the SMA. I would probably favor the SMA based on this image. So we're going to say that this is the SMA here that is actually coming off. So this area here is the SMA. Uh, based on this image, uh, we see that we have the liver, the spleen, and then we have the portal vein here the right main portal vein there and uh, that's as far as we're actually going to get in terms of this image uh, because it's kind of far away and I don't know whether we can actually uh, discern too much of the venous system of the liver however we also do have uh, the bladder looks like uterus here cecum ascending colon, splenic flexure, descending colon, and uh, this is probably sigmoid here. Some part of sigmoid. Uh, if you'll remember, we did say that the stomach was one of the most vascular organs in the body. And so, uh, kind of... Uh, just take a note of this. We have the aorta here. 
and we have the celiac trunk or the celiac artery. And as it's branching off, we have the common hepatic artery, we have the splenic artery, and the left gastric artery. And so if we'll notice here, uh, the left gastric artery is actually supplying uh, some of the stomach, and we have the right gastric artery that is branching off of uh, the common hepatic artery. Uh, but just want you to take notice of the things that are highlighted in yellow. And uh, as you can see, the celiac trunk bifurcates three times here, and we trace the splenic artery going back here and supplying the spleen. We have the left gastric coming here and actually supplying a great deal of the stomach. We have the common hepatic here uh, that bifurcates once again and becomes uh, several different things, one of which is the right gastric artery. Uh, so we see that there is almost a maze here of, of vessels, uh, but once again, I just know pretty much the simplistic ones that I have highlighted here. Uh, in yellow and also know uh, the left gastric here will highlight it as well okay here is a 3d reconstruction which uh, sometimes allows things to be seen a little better uh, so if we focus in on the aorta we have the celiac trunk here we have the left gastric we have the splenic and we have the common hepatic here, uh, which then branches off into the gastroduodenal, uh, right hepatic, uh, right gastric. Uh, also, we have the SMA here, which, as we're seeing, uh, supplies a lot of uh, blood to the large and small intestines. Uh, we also do see that we have the bifurcation here, uh, transforming the aorta into left and right iliac arteries. And then we have another bifurcation here, transforming them into internal and external iliac arteries. Um, and so notice that the bifurcation comes after the kidneys have uh, passed this level. So uh, usually you'll go out of the scanning field of the kidneys and then as soon as you do you'll start seeing the aorta bifurcate so that's another thing to keep in mind uh, based on this image we have the right hepatic vein the inferior vena cava and the portal vein uh, we have the portal vein coming in uh, forming the the right uh, main portal vein uh, we have the inferior vena cava here and then uh, we have the right hepatic vein coming up to the inferior vena cava, uh, but really all we're going to worry about is the three things that are highlighted here. Also, uh, notice that this is the jejunum here, based on the appearance. Okay, uh, another thing to keep in mind. Uh, the way that the body actually works, uh, I, I believe that we actually have a, a nice sagittal image, uh, but just to kind of give you a reference, the three main uh, arteries that we really talked about are the celiac, the SMA, and the IMA. So. So we see that the celiac actually comes first, and then almost as soon as you get out of scanning the celiac, you run into uh, the SMA. And then a little farther down around L3, you actually get the IMA. So uh, usually the SMA is around L1. So uh, the way that you can really figure out where you're at is noticing if you have ribs coming off. As we know, uh, the kidneys go from T12 to L4 sometimes and if we're seeing both the left and right kidneys coming in 
then chances are we're down to L1 at least, uh, which we I would favor because we have ribs still coming off, but we're actually getting into the kidneys. So uh, as we're looking at this image, we have the liver, spleen, we have the stomach here, which is probably the body, pyloric antrum around here, We have both left and right kidneys. We have the inferior vena cava here, uh, aorta here. And then we have this structure coming off the aorta there. And that is uh, the SMA based on the location uh, of the scan field where you're at, where we're actually scanning. Uh, and uh, I believe we've covered everything on this image. Uh, I know that it labels the gallbladder, but I feel that that is uh, the gallbladder here being a little difficult to really discern. Um, we really don't know whether this is the gallbladder or not because we're not seeing it in a full field of view. Uh, so if we go down a couple more slices, we would actually see that this is probably the gallbladder, but we can't be really sure. So I don't expect you to know on this image the gallbladder. And once again, if uh, on the exam, if I ask you a question, I'll make sure that I give you uh, an, uh, an ample chance to actually get the question right. It won't be something that's kind of thrown out and... Uh, made extremely difficult, so difficult that there's no way that you can get the right answer. On this image we're a little better. We have the actual gallbladder here. And uh, if we notice we're just now seeing the kidneys actually come in. Uh, we're just seeing the right kidney actually come in. So we're uh, still around uh, probably T12 L1 and so that means that this is the SMA here. Uh, we do have the renal arteries coming in here and here. We have the jejunum there. And also uh, this image is showing us the pancreas um, being here. And uh, the tail of the pancreas is there. Uh, we're not really seeing the head of the pancreas. And uh, we're, sh we're showed this little bitty faint line running through the pancreas and that is the pancreatic duct. Uh, we have some images that kind of lay that out just a little better than that. Uh, but pretty much uh, be aware of, of all of these things that are on this image. And here is uh, the, the better image of the pancreatic duct. We have the liver here, the gallbladder, we have the ampulla of water, and the duodenum here. And so we have the pancreatic duct that's actually running through here. We have the head of the pancreas here, tail of the pancreas there, and this area here is the body of the pancreas. Also, uh, we appear to have the splenic flexure over here and we're probably looking at uh, ascending colon going into the hepatic flexure here as well. Uh, on this image, we see that we're just now getting the left kidney. Uh, we're still going through the liver, so we're not actually going into the right kidney yet. We have uh, the aorta. We have the spleen. The stomach. And left kidney. Uh, here's a better demonstration of the kidney as well. We have the medulla, which is the renal pyramids here, 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 and here. We have the cortex. 
of the kidney. Notice we do have the diaphragm coming in. We have the jejunum. And we have the stomach here, which this would be the fundus, this would be the body. We also do see in relationship to the kidney that we have uh, the calluses here and here and here all coming in to forming the renal pelvis. Uh, so pretty much everything on this image uh, is fair game. Um, I feel very confident that each of you can actually discern what we're looking at on this image because it's very clear. Okay, Here's a diagram that kind of demonstrates the relationship of the SMA and the celiac trunk. So as we saw before, the celiac trunk actually comes out and we have three branches. We have the left gastric, the splenic, and the common hepatic. And so slightly below that is the superior mesenteric coming out like this. And then down just a little farther before the order actually bifurcates is the IMA. So those are things that we need to keep in mind. We have the renal arteries here, left and right. Uh, we have the adrenal glands sitting on top of the kidneys. We have the aorta bifurcating uh, and transforming into in uh, right and left internal iliac arteries or iliac arteries and then transforming into internal and external iliac arteries on left and right side. Um, I believe that actually covers everything for this image that I would like you to know. Uh, there's all of these little bitty arteries uh, that we could uh, cover but I feel that that is uh, much too strenuous to actually go over because of the amount of diagrams that we actually have. Uh, um, it's more important to actually know what these arteries actually supply than uh, where they are. Uh, we can say that we have the lumbar arteries and we have the four pairs coming out uh, here, 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 and here. Uh, bilaterally and so that kind of simplifies the matters slightly okay on this image uh, we still have uh, the liver in the field of view we have the inferior vena cava the aorta we are having both kidneys come in so we're around L1 uh, at this level And we have uh, the renal artery and the renal vein, which may be, based on this image, impossible to discern. Uh, but the renal artery, uh, if you're doing a CTA, will always be the, the vessel that's really highlighted going into uh, the kidneys. And so, uh, based on this, uh, as we can see, we actually have uh, adenated contrast going through the kidneys, coming out the ureters, and so perhaps this is not the best scan to actually be looking at uh, because it kind of gets everything confused because we we have uh, stuff for uh, contrast returning through the venous system. Uh, this image will help to really define uh, the celiac, SMA, IMA, and the renal arteries. And so we have the aorta coming down here. We have the bifurcation to left and right iliac arteries. We have uh, the celiac trunk here. The SMA slightly below it. The IMA coming off here. And we have left and right main renal arteries. Uh, reaching the renal hilum and then branching into several different types. We actually had five different types that it branched into. Uh, also, one thing to keep notice of, uh, we talked about the celiac and the SMA and their relationship, how 
uh, you come out of the S, uh, the celiac, and then you'll you should be seeing the SMA. But another thing to keep in mind is that uh, the celiac can actually branch from the SMA. Uh, it's not uncommon to have this abnorm abnormality. Uh, so uh, they're always going to be very close in proximity based on just that simple fact. Uh, this image uh, hopefully will be a little more clearly defined for you. We have uh, the portal vein here, inferior vena cava here. And we have the aorta and something branching off here. And so we see that this is the celiac trunk. And the reason we can be assured that this is the celiac trunk is we still are seeing the spleen and the liver. We're not seeing any kidneys. So we know that we're above T12. And so the only thing that should exist there is the celiac trunk. We also see that we have the bifurcation here and here. And so we have the splenic artery coming this way and the common hepatic artery coming this way. Uh, we don't actually see uh, the left gastric artery on this, on the bifurcation. We also do see that we have uh, the stomach here, the body. Uh, we do see some of the rugae being here. And we do have um, the falciform ligament there for the liver. And I believe that that is it for that image. Uh, looking at this uh, diagram, we see that we have uh, the celiac axis or celiac trunk. Once again, we have the splenic artery, the common hepatic artery, and the left gastric artery coming to uh, the stomach. And we do see that we, the splenic artery is also supplying the pancreas as it's going through to the spleen. This image is uh, much the same. See that we have the stomach here. Probably uh, the splenic flexure. We have liver, spleen, and we're just now seeing uh, the left kidney come in. And so we're still up probably around T12. So we're seeing the celiac getting ready to go out. Uh, we're seeing the splenic artery coming towards the spleen. And uh, this is the left gastric artery, which is kind of hard to discern. Uh, the only reason we can actually be assured that that is it, because it's not quite as large as the splenic and common hepatic, but it does branch off the celiac trunk. Uh, so just be mindful of what we're looking at. The splenic and the common hepatic are going to be much larger. Uh, the left gra gastric artery is going to be much smaller. Here's an image that I, I really think that kind of helps put everything together. Uh, so we have uh, the celiac trunk coming off around 12. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, S1. And so uh, coming off at 12, we have the celiac. Coming off at L1, we have the SMA. And then coming off around L3, L4 is the IMA. And so help, that, that will help keep things in, in uh, proportion and hopefully help keep things a little more straight than what we uh, typically would have had. So uh, notice here that we're just now seeing the left kidney come in. Uh, I disagree with this being labeled here. Uh, I think that this probably is uh, still celiac, but I uh, really can't discern whether it's SMA or uh, celiac based on the location here. I think we still have too much of liver coming in, still seeing spleen. We have body of the pancreas and uh, stomach. So I think we're still too high up to actually be uh, the SMA. 
but nonetheless, I feel that this image possibly could be uh, confusing, so uh, we're not going to really require you to know uh, pretty much anything on it. Don't know the SMA. Uh, kind of throw this image out because I feel that it's too confusing. Uh, if I were to give you something like this, I would tell you that this is L2. And if it's L2, then you should know that this is SMA uh, or L1. Uh, in reference to the previous image. Uh, here's another 3D reconstruction that I feel really kind of uh, demonstrates things very well as well. Uh, we have uh, the aorta coming down the celiac trunk. We have uh, left gastric, uh, splenic, common hepatic, and then uh, below that we have the SMA uh, dividing here. And uh, we really don't get a good demonstration of the IMA on this because everything is kind of overshadowing it. But we also do have right and left renal arteries. And we do have uh, right and left iliac arteries and then internal and external iliac arteries as well. Here's an MRA and uh, kind of demonstrates the renal arteries very well. We have the descending aorta, aorta coming down. So this area here is the descending aorta. We have the renal artery, both right and left renal artery. And then we have left and right common iliac arteries. Then internal and external iliac arteries. So there is uh, a great deal of bifurcation. We'll learn more about the iliac arteries and their branches as we continue into the pelvic region. Uh, but we do have the renal arteries and then we have the renal veins Notice we have the inferior vena cava, 